Okay, good morning everybody. Today I'm going to talk about uh, visibility, sky view factor, solar irradiation simulations and, and the making of a solar envelope. And before I start, I would like you to note that most of these computations are based on computations uh, of visibility. And visibility in turn comes from some geometric intersections, right? But before getting started with the technical parts, so let me remind you of the motivation for doing all this. Um, by the way, uh, in some sources, you find similar materials with the title solar ge geometry. Uh, I don't think it's the best title, but just in case you notice such presentations, they, they do exist with such a name. Anyhow, so it, it's about the sun in general. Um, and so why, why should we do these kind of computations? The, the sky view factor is a bit uh, of a longer story, but in general, if you remove uh, solar access and, and sunlight from architectural configurations, they will be nothing more than packs of things. And um, so you can find such packs, intricate packs of things in, for instance, integrated circuits. So without um, sunlight, architectural configurations are not very different from other sorts of configurations such as factory configurations and, and, and integrated circuit chips uh, configuration. Um, so solar irradiation, in fact, on, on the planet Earth is the main source of energy uh, that is even available in food, in, in uh, hydraulic power, in, in lots of things all forms of energy basically on the planet Earth, except from, except for the, the nuclear energy, one way or another come from solar energy, right? So the solar heat is also necessary uh, for, for uh, human health, vitamin D, you know, you know about vitamin D and the lack of vitamin D, which is associated with getting a cold and depression, et cetera, et cetera. So it's also about the human factors, uh, um, the importance of daylight. But as I said, so this is just, uh, this was just a motivation. Uh, as I said, uh, when you get to the bottom of these kind of computations, they almost always have something to do with visibility analysis, right? And what is, what is the nature of visibility? Uh, long story short, there's one very, very important um, algorithm or um, method that um, helps us ascertain visibility or invisibility of things, which is typically the intersection of a ray and a, and a triangle, you know? So what's a ray? A ray is like half of a line, a mathematical line, which is endless in one direction, and it's, it has a starting point P on one side. And then the intersection of a line and a line in a three-dimensional space is, is kind of a mission impossible almost, right? There's the chance that a line intersects another line in a, in a 3D space is very, very low. Um, but the chance that a line intersects something two-dimensional is relatively reasonable compared to that. So you have an object, you want to see if a ray of light sees that object or not, then that question boils down to whether there's an intersection between the two things or not, right? And so all of these things that I'm talking about today are one way or another related to this business. Well, how do you compute intersections? What is the general idea behind computing intersections? So you have probably seen such uh, systems of linear equations in high school mathematics. So if you have two lines on a plane and then you, you write the two equations uh, next to each other, and then you put X and Y in, in, a, in a plane, in a two-dimensional plane, and then you are after two variables, X and Y, such that these two variables satisfy the two equations corresponding to the lines. If you have a, the 3D equivalent of this situation is three planes who might be intersecting in one point or not. What's the meaning of all that? Regardless how you actually solve these equations, what's the meaning of that? that you're looking for a point that satisfies the three equations at the same time. What, what, those, what do those equations mean, actually? Anybody? So each of those equations, I, I usually use a word that I call a locus, right? 
What is a plane as a locus? Frank, you wanted to? Vertices? Hmm? Not vertices or not? Or, or points, you could say. Because in this case, a plane is a geometric locus of points. But then there's a property. Edges or lines? If they're... No, no, no. We, we're not talking about... We're not talking about a bounded rectangle here. We're talking about an infinite plane, right? How do you characterize an infinite plane? That was at the end of my linear algebra lecture notes. What's special about a plane? Remember? Do you need a reminder? So if I, if I take my, my palm as a plane, yeah, it's an infinite locus of points, all of which have one special property, and that is that their position vectors are perpendicular to the normal of that plane. So if this is a point on this plane, the position vector of this point will be perpendicular to the normal of the plane, right? And in that sense, the plane I'm talking about actually cuts through the whole universe so breaks the whole planet Earth into two halves, even cuts through Australia and all that, right? Yeah, so it's an infinite locus of points, all of which have the same property. That is the fact that the position vectors are starting from the origin of this plane is perpendicular to this normal vector. How do you state that fact mathematically? What was perpendicularity all about? What is the necessary and sufficient condition for perpendicularity in mathematical terms? Their dot product to, product to the normal vector is zero. Yeah, right. perfect. So how, how do you state all those things? Some, oops, where is it? Some um, okay, annotation. Do you see anything being written? Um, I lost this option. Does anybody know why this has disappeared? Okay, so let's say there's some kind of P0, which is like a, an origin on this plane, and I don't draw a rectangular boundary because it's not actually boundless, right? And suppose that there's a normal vector called N, right? So if I wanted to describe the locus of points whose position vectors are perpendicular, then I should write that as, let's say this is one of those points, right? This is a vector of x, y, and z. So the equation which has x, y, and z in it has to characterize what is special about this point, p, right? So what's special about this point, p? This vector P minus P zero, this is a vector, this is a vector, dot product. Okay, tell me the rest, must be zero. And this is not a vector, this is just a scalar, right? Yeah? When you write that down, then you get to, well, P minus P zero is basically X minus X sub zero, Y minus Y sub zero, z minus z sub zero. And let's say n is written as a, b, c. Then what's the dot product of these two? a x minus x sub zero plus b times y minus y sub zero plus c times z minus z sub zero should be equal to zero, right? Then you as, arrange the, the parts and bring all the parts that have something to do with the unknowns, which are x, y, and z to the left. And then you get to a, x plus b, y plus c, z equals or minus a, yeah, let's say equals a sub x zero plus b y sub zero plus c z sub zero. 
these are constants, right? So x sub zero is a constant pertaining to the p zero, which is the origin of the plane, right? y sub zero is again a constant, c sub zero is a constant, a, b, and c are all constants, right? Pertaining to the normal vector of that plane, right? The only variables are x, y, and z here, right? So just pay attention to the fact that this is not a vector equation anymore. This is just a linear equation, yeah? With only unknowns at x, y, and z. So it exactly does what we want it to do. It characterizes what's special about points being on this plane in terms of their coordinates in this coordinate reference system, right? And it's typical because all these things are constant to call them some value D and then bring them to the other side and put them like this, right? That doesn't change the meaning of them. Is anybody in any way uncomfortable with this? Yeah, and if you are looking for a point that characterizes the intersection between these planes, then what should be true about that point? That point should satisfy all these equations at the same time, right? Which means that there should be a, a vector of x, y, and z that 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 satisfies all these three equations at the same time. By the way, there's a seems to be a typo here. These are y. Yeah. Okay. So if such a point exists, then it should satisfy all these three equations at the same time. So there are some tricks I will not get into them, but in most linear algebra packages, then you can write this as a matrix. You can call this A, and you can call this X, and you can call this B. So most linear algebra packages have something like this. AX equals b so this is a vector this is a vector this is a matrix if you want to solve this you typically write a that solve for b and then you get the x which is the unknown right so in numpy and any any other reasonable numerical library there's such a matrix which solves this equation and after you solve this equation you get what the intersection point basically right so this is what it takes to do uh to compute intersections right so i hope now you have a better feeling about this right or worse feeling but uh there's no simpler way to do this and but you don't have to do this from scratch you have these packages that do this kind of thing so now get, let us get back to the, to the equation, uh, to the two equations that we need to solve for a ray and a triangle. So because this is so central, I'm, I'm getting deeper into this one. Um, I'm doing this not because you have to do this, because you, you, you have actually the, the methods that compute such intersections you will see in the workshop of this afternoon that we are using geometric libraries that do have these methods. Nevertheless, I think it is, didactically useful to look at this once again because it also sharpens your memory about linear algebra and it's useful later in life as well. So what, how do you write the equation of a ray? I, I want you to get familiarized with this idea of a locus. How do you write the equation of a ray? So again, let, let us do it from scratch to, to, to see what's going on. What's a ray? You know, imagine this is the this is a perfect flashlight, like a laser flashlight like this. And you emit a ray from the flashlight, right? You wanna see if it sees a triangle somewhere in the space. How do you write the equation, the mathematical equation of this ray? You know, what, what's the direction of the flashlight? If you were to write a direction, what would you write? Uh, well, in this case, oh, sorry. Hmm? Sander. Uh The direction would be a vector and uh, the flashlight would also uh, contain a spot. So yeah, say, so for example. This is a point, let's call it P0 and let's call this D. Then how would you characterize all the other points that are in the laser beam? Some uh, scalar multiple of D. 
So P0 plus uh, some scalar multiple uh, times D. Some alpha times D should be sufficient to, to characterize any point on the ray. Do we I need think... to state another condition? Just one more condition. Um, oh yeah, where? Um... Let, me, let me ask this as a, as a quiz. <laughs> one more condition. If you don't volunteer, I have to call, call names. Tim. What do you I don't know. Does this characterize any point on this ray? If I put uh, zero, is that correct? Zero for alpha. This is a vector. This is a vector. Mm, I don't think so with zero. Yeah. What's wrong with that? If I put zero here, I get P zero. Yeah, then. Uh... Then P zero is on the ray, so that's correct, right? Yeah. How about, does anybody see the, do you see the, that there should be another condition on something? Yeah. Maybe there should be an end to the vector, uh, like the triangle, there the, there it's no, no, not. We're not talking about the triangle yet, we're just talking about the laser beam. So alpha can be- Yeah, but the beam stops where it meets the triangle. No, actually the, the ray goes on. Oh, okay, okay. It has to be a positive number because it can't go in the other direction. So alpha, we say that it's a member of R plus, or maybe the better way to write it is zero to positive infinity. So if you put yeah. alpha as a negative number, it would give you a point that is behind the flash, right? right? That would be the other side. So if it were a line, then you could have alpha as a member of the set of real numbers. That would be absolutely fine. But that's exactly the difference between a ray and a line, right? So a ray only includes one side of the line. Yes? Okay, so this, this could be the ray, right? But what is this one doing here? What is P1 and P0? Lotte. Uh. I really don't know, actually. I so, think it stands for the D, but yeah. So I don't know where the P1 comes from. So if we say that, well, if you want to make it look, look like this one, then this would be D, right? Yeah. So what, what is P1 then? If I put any other point here, imagine I didn't give you D explicitly, and I gave you only two points. And I told you that one of them is the flashlight. The other one is on the ray. Could you make D for me that way? I don't really get what you mean. So if I didn't give you D explicitly mm -hmm. as a vector, but I only gave you two points, would that be sufficient information to get the... Oh, uh, then D is maybe yeah. between the two points. Yeah, so D would be P1. Minus P0. Yeah. But, but how do you know where P1 is on the ray? Okay, that's a good one. But let, let's revisit this equation, right? What do we really mean by this? Any idea about this one? What, what does this actually mean? Because these are vectors, these are not numbers, right? So we're talking about addition of two vectors because the other way to write this is P0 plus D equals P1. Any objection to that? If I add P0 to both sides, I, at least algebraically, I can see this, this makes sense, right? But what does it mean in terms of vector additions? Shouldn't, uh, well, I usually say that we shouldn't draw these pictures, but let's say for the sake of this argument, let's draw these pictures. So let's say this is P0, this is P1. And I think it was you, Lotte, once, you once asked me what is the meaning of x, y, z when we write x0, y0, z0. Where do we write them from? What is the origin? Yeah, so there should be an origin, right? Because we start counting yeah. from zero. Where is zero? 
So let's say for the sake of the argument that zero is here. So this is zero, zero, zero. Called O. Yeah. So what's the meaning of P zero? Is a vector that goes from point zero to P zero. Exactly. And this one for P one, and this must be D. Yeah. Okay, so when I read this, this one makes sense, doesn't it? So P is going from here to here and then going from here to here is the same as going from here to here directly. So P zero plus D equals P one, right? Yeah. Can be stated also in this way. And therefore, what was, what was I going to talk about? Yeah, so therefore this, this makes sense as a vector equation, but then you ask me what, what should be the size. Yeah. The size, because the whole thing is not constrained in, in, in any way from the right side, then the size of this vector doesn't matter. So you, you should not worry whether it's bigger than one or smaller than one. As long as this is pointing in that direction, this should be okay. But if you want to have a perfect control, what is the perfect control? So if alpha is between zero and one, then think about this, where will you be if alpha is between zero and one? You actually have that sort of control. Someone else? Hey, Doug. Yeah. Um, between P0 and P1, right? Who was that? Uh, you go here. You go. Okay. Hi, you go. Hey. Okay. So, uh, yes, between P0 and P1. Does everybody see that? So, if alpha is between 0 and 1, then, then the point will be exactly in between these two. But as Lotte asked, then there's no other bound. So if alpha is larger than one, then we will be talking about all the points from P1 to infinity, right? So let's, let's get really comfortable with this equation because this is key here. So what do you think will be the way to solve the, the intersection between a ray and a, and a triangle? I've written everything here, but, but nevertheless, let's revisit the whole thing. So we're looking for a parameter r or alpha or whatever else we call it, which is a, a scalar parameter. So that's why it's not bold like this one. And every point on that ray can be characterized as a function of that parameter r, right? So r as an input determines where we are on that ray, right? Everything else about the ray is known, right? It's p0 is known, it's p1 or uh, the other, some other point on the ray are known. So that means we know everything we need to know about the ray. So anything else on that ray is only determined by R. Yeah, everyone sees that fact, right? So a single value, a single real scalar value determines where we are on that ray. And then, so, okay, so speaking about a point on that ray is somewhat more difficult than speaking about one single variable, scalar variable R. Wouldn't you agree? Right? So speaking about just one R parameter, where on that plane equals to just a single number. Right? You see what I'm getting at? So we, only determining one number means that we know exactly where we are along that ray. Right? So the question of where reduces to the question about one single number. That's the benefit of this equation. So if we state this other one, which I find one of the most beautiful equations in linear algebra about what we call the span of two vectors. Yeah, so how, how does this pertain to a triangle? Do you see a triangle in here? You have an origin point and then two directions in which they go. Yeah, so it's kind of like a pair of scissors, isn't it, right? So U and V, yeah. Well, what does this have to do with a triangle exactly? So let's say P0, and I have given you P1 and P2. Now you can write P1 and uh, U and V in terms of P1 and P2, can't you? So U will be P1 minus P0 in the same 
manner that we computed the other v vector, right? And v will be p2 minus p0. It, it may appear to you that I'm stating the obvious here, but I'm doing this to, to help you get comfortable with mathematical notations and so that you don't look at them as gibberish anymore, okay? These are, these are beautiful equations. So what do they mean here now? What is uh, V0 here or we can do that later? V0 would be another way to state P0. Oh, that's P0, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so V1, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I've written it yeah. here. In terms oh, of yeah, I see, yeah, yeah. It's just a different... Uh... Vertex or points, yeah. So, but if I put some values, the scalar values like S and T, and multiply these values by u and v, yeah, where do I get? If these values are positive, where will I be? Is it possible that I, let's say this is a pair of scissors with u and v, right? And the pair of scissors together with the origin point, they will be definitely on one plane, right? Yeah? They have to be on a plane, right? So you have, the other way to think about it is that you have these three points. And with three points, you definitely have a plane, don't you? Right? The other way to think about it is that the, the cross product of these two will make a, a normal vector that is perpendicular to both of them and it will be in the direction of your thumb. Well, in this case, I, I kind of messed it up because this, is, this will be pointing actually on the other side. So let's not change it. So if I choose my left hand to be the guiding gizmo for this one, then I align my middle finger with U and my index finger with V and I, then my thumb will be pointing towards the direction of the normal vector, which will be going into the screen. If it's going to the screen, then I show it with a cross like this. If it was pointing outward the screen, then I would show it with this sign. Yeah? These are customary signs for showing vectors pointing outward from a piece of paper or pointing inwards into the piece of paper. Yeah? This is the trick that I told you before about determining the direction of the cross product. Yeah? So, the two of them are actually indicating a plane in that sense, right? You have two vectors and a single point, they indicate a plane. The other way to look at it is that you have three points together, they form a plane as a locus of points in the same sense that I talked about before. So any point on this locus, on this paper, has a position vector that is perpendicular to that normal vector, right? So now, Okay, I'm taking it a bit slowly here because I want to make sure that everyone feels comfortable with this. So what, it, what would be a, the result of this equation here? So this is a scalar multiplied by V. So that takes us in this direction somewhere here. Do you agree? A, a scalar times U takes us somewhere here. Yeah, plus V0, of course. Yeah, so I'm, I'm forgetting about the other part. And a scalar plus uh, times this one takes us somewhere along this one, right? If it's a positive scalar. So if I add the two of them together, where will I be? Two vectors added together, so how, how do I get the result? You just add them up, so it's in the top right more. So at the end of the screen, sort of, you know, right there. Is this so you could like um, describe any point on the surface of a plane just with the S and T values? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So if I add these two vectors, one which is like, let's say S times, let's, let's say T times V and S times U. S times U will be this one. Right? So I add them together, I get to a new vector, which is this one. Agreed? Because I can always write this one here. Remember, vectors do not have a position. 
So everything is falling in place, right? So this vector and this vector are perfectly the same. Therefore, we can use a parallelogram to draw the result. And therefore, this is exactly where I will be if I add S times U and T times V with V0. So conclusion, any combination of S and T such that S and T is are, are positive numbers, then we'll get us somewhere. And this so-called quadrant of this span of vectors, this is called a quadrant. Why a quadrant? Because as soon as you have these two vectors, then they kind of divide your plane into four parts, hence the name quadrant. So this is called the quadrant one. So with S and T positive, I will be here. Right? If one of them is negative, then you will see what happens. If this is U and this is V, then you know the rest of the story. Isn't it similar to this story of X and Y being perpendicular to each other? Both positive, you are here. X negative and Y positive, you are here. Both negative, you are here. X positive and Y negative, you are here. Four quadrants again, right? It's exactly the same story, only a bit skewed. Yeah? So long as U and V are not exactly pointing towards the same direction, then you have these spans, these quadrants, and you have the span, right? That's a condition for defining a plane or making sense as a triangle together, right? Are you getting bored? No? <laughs> okay. So this is as. Um, so this is what it means. So this is a, a very interesting website that uh, kind of lists these algorithms for doing this. So let's, let's recapitulate what we're talking about here. So if you want to find out whether there exists an intersection between a ray and a triangle, then you have to figure out whether there exists numbers that could satisfy all these equations at the same time, whether there could be a point on both of loci at the same time. This is a locus, this is a locus. And if there is an intersection, there has to be a point that satisfies both loci at the same time, right? So you solve these equations, you figure out whether S and T are um, possibly existing, such that a point in that triangle or at least on that plane <clears throat> can exist. And then if both S and T are in the range of zero and one, then the point in question is not only on that plane, but is actually inside the triangle in question. Yeah. And that would be the, the, the same thing as an intersection point existing also on that ray, because if the ray has an intersection with the plane, that means there's a point that satisfies both loci equations. Yeah? So, um, is there a situation where there's definitely not an intersection between a ray and a, and a triangle? And how can we detect that very quickly? If there is. Leva. Parallel? Hmm? They're parallel to each other? Yeah, how, how would we detect that? Uh, if there is an, um, the dot product, if it's zero. Yeah, which dot product? Between the vector and... The vector of the ray and... And the normal? The normal of that plane. If the two are perpendicular, that means the ray is parallel to the plane. So no intersection, right? That is called typically a determinant, yeah, which makes sense because it determines whether there exists an intersection point or not. If that determinant is zero, that means there is no, no intersection point. So we shouldn't bother with the rest of the computation. Tim, yes. Which one uh, does have to be zero? The normal of the plane? Yeah, so if you have, um, the plane has a normal. Yeah, right? normal of a plane. And which plane are we talking about? The plane on which the triangle in question is drawn, right? Or maybe, better to draw it like this. So you have a P0, P1, and P2. Uh, let me see. Let's say P1 here and P2 here. No, P1 here and P2 here, so that the normal is actually pointing outward, right? So this is a normal. If our ray is drawn in such a way that 
you know, this is 3D. So if this ray has a direction D, P prime zero and has a direction D. And if D is perpendicular to N, that means the ray in question is parallel to that plane. So yeah. there's no way that they intersect, right? And that should do the job because this is very, very easy to compute. So that product of two vectors is very quick to com compute. Then we can easily see if they, they possibly have an intersection or not. It will be impossible for them to have an intersection if this product is zero, right? If it is not zero, then it could be that this ray intersects somewhere really far away on this plane. Then we compute S and T for that point on this plane. And we realize that S and T are too large to be inside the triangle. That means the intersection again is not in the triangle. But at least we don't compute for cases which do not possibly have any intersections, right? So we do it in two steps. And that's where what is explained on this website. And that's what we have implemented a couple of times. And that's what exactly is implemented in many geometric libraries for doing this, okay? Okay, I have so many other stuff, so I have to speed up, but I wanted you to have a good feeling about uh, the basis of all this. That's why I went to the details. So if you put so many such ray intersections together, you get into something that is called a visibility polygon. So imagine you are standing somewhere in an environment and you have some kind of a limit to your sight. Let's say um, the limit to your sight is the, the limit at which you can, you can read a, a license plate number if you're working for the police, for instance, right? With naked eyes, yeah? So that, let's say that is like 100 meters, right? So that will be your visibility polygon as a police officer, something like that, right? And if something is behind the walls, then you cannot see it, right? So every time you have an intersection, you put a point and then you kind of connect all these points together and you make the visibility polygon. This is exactly the same thing that is used for understanding the visibility of a guard in, a, in an art gallery. Right? What is that? What is it that they can see? Yeah. So if you don't put a radius for the for the visibility of the faces, for for the for the length at which you can recognize the face and so on, then you get a polygon that looks more like what you can see here. This is an amazing, amazing uh, explanation. Let me take you to the other side. a really cool website. Do you see it? Which explains you in multiple steps how the, how the whole visibility polygon is made. And step by step, you get even to a spooky version, which has even some shadows and so on. So one of the best explanations I could find online. Yeah. So the other one that I was showing you is a, is the one that I myself have made for, for, um, Layout algorithms. This is a three-dimensional version. So if you if you do the same with points in 3D and then you shoot rays towards any kind of uh, di direction. So you tessellate the directions in space by looking at the vertices of this polygon, which will be basically a box. Can you see? This is basically a box that is inflated. Do you see that? This is the corner of the box, right? then you kind of virtually inflate it and you get this visibility polygon, voila, right? So now what does this have to do with solar studies? Here's an example. So um, here we have something that is called the sky visibility polygon, which is a half of that sort of a balloon, right? 
This is the upper hemisphere. So there's something about the visibility of the sky, which is very important for, for uh, environmental reasons. Um, that is the fact that if your building wants, needs to cool down uh, during the night, then it has to be able to radiate back some of the heat that it has absorbed during the day towards the sky, right? That's how buildings cool down during the night. And if they cannot radiate such amount of heat, then they heat up to dangerous levels. And that phenomenon is called urban heat island effect, right? I'll get back to this one, the visibility, and, and just let me tell you this one. So the, you can compute the extent to which a point on a piece of land sees the sky, you know. So if you're in the middle of a desert, in the middle of nowhere, then you see perfectly the, the entire sky. So the hemisphere has no intersections with any obstacles, right? Then, but if you are in the middle of what is colloquially called an urban canyon, it looks like a canyon in between uh, mountains, then you see much less of the sky, arguably, right? Then the chances of heating up is much more. And that's why we, for instance, among other things that we do with the visibility, we may wish to compute the so-called sky view factor to approximate that phenomenon. So you are in a, in a valley or a canyon like this one. How much of the sky do you see? Definitely less than this point B, right? This, is, this could be attributed to the area on that hemisphere that is visible without any obstruction, isn't it? Right? So then if you are in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of a desert or a meadow, then you see everything from the skies, which is almost the same thing as saying that every point on this, hem on this virtual hemisphere is reached without any obstacles in the way, right? But here, if you draw the, the hemisphere in question, then you only see a, a relatively small part of the hemisphere on the top, close to zenith, right? And therefore, the sky view factor is less than one. How much less than one that determines basically your radiative cooling, um, cooling potential, yeah? By the way, don't make no mistake that this is also the same thing that keeps cities warm, you know, especially the dark cities being uh, cold during the winter. If you have buildings that are far apart from each other, they also cool down much more quickly. And that means that they should probably spend more energy. But a part of the warmth in your house probably comes from the neighbors radiating towards your house, right? Because instead of radiating their heat towards the sky, they're radiating towards your house, right? So it's, it's not so that you have to aim for a sky view factor of one, necessarily. This, the, the real answer to that question is more complicated, but this is one of the parts that contributes something to the so-called urban heat island effect. There are of course more, more things like the material, the, the, the rate at which they absorb and the reflectivity, et cetera, et cetera. This is an indicator of the potential for radiative cooling. One cog of that machine. Okay. Okay, so technically I should give you a break right now. But, um, and looking at all the other things that I want to talk about, then maybe I can, I can leave this part for questions and answers during your break if you're interested and save the rest for the second 45 minutes. What shall I do? I'm, I'm perfectly fine with skipping the break, but I don't think you will be fine with that. <laughs> what do you say? Can we have a small break? A short yeah. break, maybe, maybe a quarter, like five, five minutes, eight minutes, or ten minutes, five minutes. Okay. So, um, when do we start? Five before twelve. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. I have a small question about the first um, uh, fish about this uh, sky view factor. Mm -hmm. um, this one? This one. Uh, you're muted, I can't hear you anymore. Oh, the, um, where it's not, it's the view factor where he talks about the uh, uh, police side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, this one. Why are the edges rounded? Ah, uh, because I put a maximum radius here, but but this yeah. is a slightly different case. So here I was I was um, readjusting the visibility polygon in such a way as to make sure that the the area of the visibility polygon is the same as the area of the the theoretical disk with that yeah. area because I wanted to make spaces that look like visibility polygon. So I said that the space has to have an area of like like 100 square meters. Yeah. And because it's visibility, this polygon, this visibility polygon is kind of damaged or obstructed, then it reaches outward to compensate for the lost area. Um, yes, but I mean the corners of the uh, outward side, like where it meets the building and then it continues and then it stops somewhere, mm -hmm. like the corners, why are they around? Yeah, yeah, those corners. Yeah, yeah. as I said, this is this is a slightly different version. This, this I called it the, the smart isovist polygon. Isovist is the same as a visibility polygon. This yeah. is not a, a static version. This is a dynamic version. It's a... Practically, a, they are not around it, right? No, most probably not. Life. You know, in, yeah. in the slide, in the website that I showed you, they are actually not round because they reach to whatever. Yeah, it's just a model, I it. think. But if you put a radius around them, you you could have cut them here. You know, if you said that yeah. the visibility range is like one hundred meters, yeah. then you had you had a range on the on the radii, right? But here is a bit confusing, I agree with you, because I'm not only talking about the radius here, I'm only talk, also talking about this, the square area of the visibility polygon. As yeah. a, I'm readjusting re the radii in such a way as to compensate for this amount of lost area. So what is lost here and here and here yeah. is compensated by going a bit farther on these fronts. And the reason that it, it gets really round around here is that, um, what is that? Yeah, so it's it's a connection between these vertices. So you, you can see that pertaining to every ray here, I have a vertex, right? Yeah, I can together see Together I get a polygon. Yeah. Right? And it ends up being round because of those computations about area that I'm doing here. That's That's something additional. Okay, so it's not, it does not have uh, a meaningful. Yeah, but power. also if you put a, a radius and say, cut them at, um, okay, let me state it algorithmically, that's easy. So let's say that you find uh, a hit point along the ray. If the, 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 the radius, the, the radius, which is the R on the ray times D, plus P zero. This is a point on, on one of the rays, like this one, for instance, right? Yeah. So when you intersect it with a triangle that, that is in perspective here, right? The intersection point will give you an R that will be actually larger than the radius. So let's say you have a radius called uh, radius of visibility. So which is 100 meters. Yeah. Right? Actually, I should have written it like this, okay? 100 meters. So we have a radius of visibility for, for a police officer for reading a plate, license plate number. When we do the intersection here, we get an R from this equation. The only unknown in this equation is R, right? We know exactly the direction of shooting the ray. We know the position of the police officer. Then we will find, we want to find this point, but the way we, we do this is that we find an R along the, 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 the ray, and then we get to something that in this case should be more than 100, right? Because this is actually farther away from one. If this is exactly 100, yeah. this is farther away, right? And then we say, okay, if it was, if R was larger than R visibility, P equals P of R of visibility. So P is a function of R, right? Always on the ray. So we have this equation. That's how we can actually build a ray 
I mean, build any point that we desire on the array, we can build it like this. If you put an R in this equation, it's really like a function whose input is, an, is a value R and whose output is a value P of R, mm -hmm. right? So you put some value R in here, everything else is known. This is a constant, this is a constant. You put an R here, you get a point on the array, right? Mm -hmm. uh, simple computation with Python, you get a point on the array. So if we say that the, if R is farther away from the, is larger than the radius of visibility, then make the point exactly at R of visibility. That will give you this point here because oh. this is still on the array, but this is exactly where the radius of visibility is. Yeah. But that does not yet explain the route corners. No, no. But then you get this one, let's say this one. For this one, R will be exactly less than the radius of visibility. Yeah, so then it just stops. And else, P will be exactly P of R. Yeah. So you get a bunch of points like this, then you connect them together, then you get a round. Yeah. But the... Um, so here it will be round. It will be round because we are we are snapping them back to the radius of visibility. So I know that there is an intersection farther away. Maybe there has been an intersection here for these ones. Yeah. But I'm snapping them back to the radius of visibility here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So this is how you get this round frontier. Yeah. If you're also talking about these ones, the, the yeah, main, main. light rounding here. That's only because there you have an R that is yeah. less than 100, but yeah. because it's rounded, you just yeah. cut up a little bit of the yeah, like so you make it like 89, 98 or so. Yeah, this is only the artifact of our resolution, right? So if I if I really zoom in here and if I had infinitely many points, then I should have seen a kink here. Yeah. Right? But yeah. because I probably don't have so many points here, I, I connect them here like this one. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's the uh, then it looks a bit yeah. more you know, funky than necessary, right? So it, okay. it looks yeah. like <laughs> So it's just because of the resolution. Yeah, yeah. Because we, we don't afford to shoot like infinitely many rays, you know, and I'm yeah. here something like a hundred rays or 200 rays, there's a limit. Okay. Thank you. That was the main question. Thank you for the question. So um, that was a nice question and the answer is recorded so you can visit it later. Uh, let me continue with what I was doing here. Um, I kind of want to say a little bit about this and, and leave you to, to study the, the, the slides later on and you can always get back to me with questions about them. Nevertheless, this is, this is a very important thing about um, integrals and, and derivatives. In this case, we're talking about integrals because if I wanted to compute the whole area that is visible, the whole sky area that is visible here, what, what could you do? How can you mathematically characterize that? We're talking about the area of the sky. So let's say the blue area over the entire non-blue area, something like that, right? But regardless of the color, this is the, the entire area which is unobstructed. And if you are living in a, let's say, um, in an environment that is an outdoor environment, then there should be at least a possibility that you see right above your head. That's called the direction of the zenith, right? So if I start counting from above my head, you know, what, what is... What is the last degree at which I can see the sky without any obstruction? You know, I, I, may, I may shoot a bird with my ray above my head, but okay, let's forget about birds and stuff like that. But what is the first obstacle that I hit, right? So let's, let's put it this way. I'm going to start shooting rays starting from from this direction, which is the zenith direction, right? So I only need these points to make the direction. I start shooting rays and then I go down from here downwards. 
let's say like this, right? So I go down on this line and I don't see any obstruction. So that means this, there was no obstruction in this area, right? But these were just points, remember? We, we have a limited resolution. We cannot afford to take a picture here. This picture even has pixels, right? But here in digital computation, we have to do this a finite number of times, right? So along this ray, let's say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine points, none of which intersected anything. So that means they are looking at this blue sky, blue cloudy, whatever, there was no obstruction, yeah? So we're only talking about obstructions. Is this clear, right? So along these points, there was no obstruction. You know, I started shooting rays from right above my head to all the way down to the ground, right? So what does one of these rays look like? That would be something like a point in the center towards this one. That would give me a ray, right? So I have a P1 here. I have a P0, which is the center where I'm standing, and that gives me a ray. I shoot it towards any obstacle that is in the scene. And obstacles are consisted of triangles, right? So even though you don't look at them as triangles, they can be always triangulated, right? Like this one, two triangles, yeah? Two big triangles. So I have a bunch of triangles that constitute the obstacles on the scene, and then I start shooting rays at them. And here I don't see anything, right? I go to the next uh, set of points, like this one. The next one, I don't see anything, but this one, I start hitting something here. Yeah? So I then stop computing because I assume that this is a huge obstacle that also obstructs my, my sight of sky from this point downwards, right? And then I record this angle, which I call gamma. What angle from the zenith to this point, right? What is exactly the angle? So this is a spatial angle, right? You see that? This is the whole arc that is visible from the sky. Yeah? But this is just a one-dimensional angle yet. There's something else called a solid angle or two-dimensional angle, which is computed not in radians, but in ester radians, right? Anyhow, uh, regardless of that, so let us characterize what we want to characterize in terms of the area, the unobstructed area on this thing. I could have used the color blue, but anyway, you see what I'm getting. This amount of area, which is like totally unobstructed, should be indicative of what I could see from the sky without any obstruction. But if I want to make it relative, comparable to something else, if I had a point in the middle of nowhere with a hemisphere above it, then that point could see everything. So for this one, I would get an area equal to 100% of what is there, whatever that is. So if I want to make it relative, I, come, I divide this one by this one. So what is the area of this hemisphere? the surface area of the hemisphere. Anybody recalls from primary school, high school? I, I, I don't recall that number, but if anybody recalls, please enlighten me. How is that area computed anyway? Is the area of a circle? Not, not the area of a circle, but the surface area of a hemisphere yeah. or a sphere for that matter, divided by two. But how are such two, areas computed? Tell me. Two pi r squared, right? Two times pi r squared. It's, it's four pi r squared for the entire sphere. And then if you take half of that, it's two pi r squared. You are most probably right, but I don't recall that formula. So, but I'm talking about how we should compute that area. So, as I said, you are most probably right. So the way to compute it is based on integrals, right? So what's an integral? This is, uh, they're shown with this sign, which may be a bit frightening to you, but this actually means S or sum, right? Summing up 
what are known as differentials or differential elements. So in this case, we have something that is called the area differential, which is a part of the sphere. So you can, you can verify these equations by the, 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 the preliminary trigonometrics that I taught you in the first session, in the first lecture notes. You can ascertain, uh, verify that the area of this little triangle will be exactly this much. How? If we want to find out the area of this hemisphere or any part of that hemisphere, we can compute it in terms of the area of these little tiles added together. Can you agree with that? Yeah? Yeah, let, let's forget about the strange signs and, and the fact that you may find them frightening and so on, but th th this is in essence what they mean, right? So we are, again, please accept the fact that we are approximating. You know, we're not talking about the perfect round sphere. We are approximating something. Yeah. So if this is small enough, yeah, don't argue with me what's small enough, but let's say this is small enough because you have a resolution and you don't afford to shoot so many of such rays. If this is small enough, let me exaggerate it and tell you what I mean by small enough. So in reality, this is like a patch of the sphere that looks a bit exaggerated like this, right? So this is a round corner, this is a round corner, this is a round, round side, round side, and so on. All, everything is rounded a bit, right? I'm talking about this one. Yes? But if this is small enough, then I'm going to do a little bit of cheating. I would consider this a straight line. I would consider this a straight line. Consider this a straight line. And I would consider even the whole thing not as a, a skewed trapezoid, but as a rectangle. Yeah, please forgive me for that. Yeah, but I said small enough, so we are talking about approximations. So let's take this approximation. Yeah. So if this thing was such that so small that we could indeed mistake it with a rectangle, what would be the side of the rectangle here? So here you get to two kinds of uh, conventions for calling this so-called spherical coordinates. So two Greek letters are typically used, theta and phi or phi. Phi for the so-called elevation angle, theta for the azimuth angle. And there's exactly one, one reverse convention in mathematics. This is, I think, the, the physical convention which calls the other one theta and the other one phi, but I'm more comfortable with this one. Theta for azimuth on the ground and phi for, or phi for the elevation angle, like this one, yeah? You see the two angles, right? So this is phi, the elevation angle at which I see something from the ground up, yeah? So the angle I can measure between the point of sight and the ground. And the other one is like the, the latitude angle, uh, sorry, the longitude angle or the azimuth angle on the ground. In this case, the angles are in uh, degrees, right? Instead of in radians? No, 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 everything is- Is radians. it also still radians? No, no, radians, indeed. Good reminder, they have to be in radians. Why? Because radians and meters are the same, right? Kind of, if you have an angle in radians and multiply it R times so if I tell you this is like, I don't know, 0 0.2 radians, yeah? Remember what was the length of, what was the length of an arc? So if you have an arc of a six of pi, what's the length of the arc? Exactly. Uh, one. One? Oh, sorry. Uh... Ah, oh, sorry, okay. no, one, one fourth times pi. It depends on the uh, yeah. radius. Yeah, may, maybe nearly one in the case of the trigonometric circle, right? Um, but what exactly? So in, in general, it will be r times this theta. Remember this fact? Yeah? So whatever the angle is, so the angle is measured in radians, if it is measured in radians, only if it is measured in radians, you multiply that by the radius and you get the, the arc length, right? 
exactly the length of the arc. You, you can you can actually experiment and verify this fact with a piece of rope on your desk later on, if you don't trust me. Okay. If you have a protractor and a piece of rope, you can you can give it a try. Yeah. And so this one should be this angle multiplied by the radius. Yeah. But what's the radius of this circle? It's not the radius of the real circle. The radius of the real circle on the ground is something like this. This is a smaller radius, which is equal to this amount. I'm just showing you how you can read these lights. This is exactly equal to the side of this triangle. And then again, we're talking about triangles, hence trigonometry, how to measure dimensions in triangles given the degrees and so on, right? So what, is, what will this be? The big radius on the ground? The, the cosine. Cosine of phi. Uh, phi, yeah. Yes, cosine of phi times that gives you this amount. Because this one and this one indeed have the same length. Remember? This is a hemisphere, so this one is identical to the big one on the ground but this one is different. So this is the hypotenuse here, multiplied by cosine of theta will give you this shadow on the ground, which is exactly r times cosine of phi, at least one of them. The second one comes from where? So you have r cosine of phi, for one part, which is this part. This is only the radius of the circle at which this is located. So we are only doing this to compute this little, little fellow here, this one. You multiply it by a small change in, in the direction of, sorry, not this one, in the direction of theta times differential of theta. So if you're wondering what this is, this is just theta plus delta t, delta theta minus theta. If you are starting at some angle theta and you have a small change called delta theta, delta, the Greek letter used for difference. And if this is small enough, then you call it differential of theta. Yeah. This will be exactly how much delta theta, right? So let's say delta theta and differential of theta are the same. So this is some, like, I don't know, 0 0.01 radians, something like that, small enough, right? Or something like pi divided by 240. How many rays will that be? Anybody? If I had delta theta equal to pi divided by 240, how many rays have I shot in this direction? Uh, 480. Hmm? So the entire circuit should have been two times pi, right? Yeah. And 480 exactly. So I must have shot 480 rays in this direction so that the difference between the angle between two rays is exactly pi divided by 240. Yeah? That's what delta theta is. Yeah? So I have one side of this triangle, uh, this quad, uh, quadrilateral computed. The other side is computed similarly. I don't go into details. You can you can check it for yourself. Then I have a I have a rectangle here. Then I do some um, integration with the help of methods that you can verify from preliminary calculus. Then you get into. Uh, I'm really happy to explain all this, but I think we're running out of time and not everybody is interested. So please forgive me for cutting this short. But everything else is on the slide. You compute this value and you get to indeed what Sanne remembered from, from a book, two times pi times r squared for the hemisphere. 
if you compute these angles and note that you are starting actually from zero to um, half of pi in the direction of phi or p and in the direction of theta you are starting from zero to two times pi you're integrating you're summing up but this doesn't look so computational to me this looks like mathematical right when we are computing we are actually not dealing with integrals we are dealing with sums where everything is discrete yeah and if you make the transition from this one to this one then you have learned something very important about simulations right so instead of differential of theta we are talking about delta theta and we have only a few of them remember 480 of them for instance right or maybe one less but in that order right then you are actually converting a, an integral to a sum yeah that is something you know how to do with python and that is something you can do with python and that's something if you do with python you will you will learn a lot right and then you can compute these angles you put them together and you compute only the area that is actually visible and divided by the area that could have been visible and then you get to something that is called the sky view factor which is simplified first mathematically into this one and then you only compute this last equation and then you get the solar the, the, the sky view factor estimation, yeah? And we're not computing, well, the, we call it estimation because this is not exactly a picture. We have a resolution, we, we are not uh, taking into account dirt and stuff like that in the sky, right? We're not looking at the clouds, we're not looking at the, so with a cloudy sky, you have less of a, a radiative cooling capacity, but we are forgetting about all those things because we want to, get to something that is only about the shape of the built environment and its effect on the functionality of this building, right? So we get to these values. I highly recommend that you study the, the, these slides in depth and, and you try to do the math yourself and check back with me if you had any questions about them. I've explained every single step of this process here so that you understand exactly what's happening, yeah? And if you are uncomfortable with the definition of an integral or a derivative, here is a quick reminder of whatever is at stake. And the, the fundamental theorem of calculus is explained here. Okay. And here I have a pseudocode for computing it. Okay. Everybody okay? with the definition so far. Okay, so let's get to the, to the maybe the more important thing about how does the earth revolve around the sun and how does that affect our solar energy potential and what does this have to do with our building design? A quick reminder of some facts, right? So do you remember from maybe primary school or middle school or high school why we have seasons on Earth? A quick reminder. So the Earth is revolving around the sun, uh, which might be a bit depressing for some people who used to think that Earth is the center of the universe, but uh, we are revolving around the sun, right? But um, there's something a bit special about this revolution around the sun. Well, let's say we are on a plane revolving around the sun, right? We are simplifying everything and let's say this is a circle. We know that this is not a circle, but for now, let us simplify everything a little bit. Let's say this is a circle. We are exactly revolving around the sun and it takes us exactly 365 days to do, to make a complete revolution, right? Doesn't matter where you start in the Georgian calendar, you start from, I don't know, um, 1st of January, let me see if this is the 1st of January. Where do you think is 1st of January, by the way? This is the Northern Hemisphere. Can, do you think we have enough information to say where it is 1st of January, almost? Volunteers. So at this point, it appears that, what's the special about this? I mean, why do we get seasons? So at this point, it appears that this, if this is the equator, right? This must be the Northern Hemisphere, right? And this is the Southern Hemisphere. 
So what do you think uh, is the season here right now? Should be summer, right? Yeah. Is it closest to the sun? Not exactly closest. Uh, or, well, some, something else at stake. What do you think is at stake here? The longest days. Hmm? The longest days. The longest. Longer days. And... Isn't it the angle of the sun? Uh, the yes. more shallow the angle is, the less light you have. Yeah. But is the sun like a desk lamp or is it something like um, something else? A very strong lamp. Yeah, what's so strong about it? Is it about the geometry or the intensity? So you're standing here and I'm standing here, right? Uh, well, okay, we are standing both in a city. Our scale is so small that we, we cannot even differentiate those two points, right? So for the purposes of this simulation, it appears that no matter where we are in that city, right, or in a very, even a very large area, the sun rays appear to be all parallel. Don't you agree? And in fact, I would say that the scale of the sun is so huge as compared to this scale is that for that matter, at that point in space, we can consider the sun a plane emitting rays rather than a point emitting rays. Yeah? So all these rays appear to be parallel for the purposes of our simulation. So let's say all these rays are parallel like this. And then in these areas, relatively speaking, let's think about this as, a, as an octahedron, for instance, right? Or a box. Let's think about it as a box. The angles of incidence are relatively speaking here, closer to things that, um, closer to angles that, um, okay, let me talk about the dot, the dot product because that's exactly what we're going to talk about. So let's say this plane has a, has a normal vector and the dot product between these two vectors is going to be a positive number or, or a negative number. This vector and this vector are almost in the same direction, right? Therefore, the dot product is going to be positive. But with this one, it's also positive, but which one is bigger? Which dot product? These two or these two? I'm oversimplifying everything to make a point. This is closer to zero actually, right? So because they're getting almost perpendicular. So the dot product is almost zero. Or you, you should be able to say that it is definitely less than this other dot product. So if one dot product corresponds to these two and the other corresponds to these two, which one is bigger? This dot product should definitely be bigger than this one, right? So the more aligned those two vectors, the higher the dot product, remember, right? So that's why here is summer and on, on the bottom side, there's winter, yeah? That situation exactly changes when we are here because here, now all the surfaces here have a better reception of these lights because they're almost perpendicular, right? Maybe instead of a box, I should have drawn a, an octahedron like this one, yeah? So it is more perpendicular for them. Therefore here is summer for the Northern hemisphere, uh, for the Southern hemisphere, right? So conclusion, where should be uh, somewhere like 1st of January? Uh, to the left side of the, where, where the summer is for the South Pole. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you, you can detect the seasons, right? And there should be two points. So this could be the summer solstice, the summer solstice in the Northern Hemisphere. And this could be a summer solstice or the winter solstice for the Northern Hemisphere, which will be almost the same as the summer solstice for the, um, for the Southern Hemisphere. 
right? And these two points should be some other points that are called equinoxes. Yeah, so there's another kind of calendar that starts counting actually from here. From equinox to equinox. From this equinox to itself is 365 days. From this solstice to, to itself is also 365 days. This is the Georgian calendar. This is the Persian calendar. But whichever way you compute, you have 365 days. Yeah. Okay, so these are some basic facts. Let's uh, get comfortable with them and let's continue. Okay, but if, okay, this, this is yet another basic fact. So if the planet Earth was, had a spinning, because there's a spinning direction, right? Like this one. The Earth also spins around itself, right? If uh, as a spinner, it was perfectly perpendicular to this plane, like this one, then we would not observe any change of seasons, right? Because this relative positioning to, in terms of the angles of incidence would not change at all throughout this cycle. You now should be able to see exactly why, right? Because you would have exactly the same kind of angles no matter where you were at the, around the year, right? So, but here in this one, well, in this sense, in, in this case, you have the highest angle of incidence in here in the northern hemisphere. You have the lowest angle of incidence. And from here to here, somewhere here, you should be in the middle. And again here, again in the middle, but going up. Here you're going down. So this one should be the... Uh, Autumn equinox or the spring equinox? Which one is this? After all, we have four seasons, right? Autumn. Should be autumn. autumn. And this is spring. So the, uh, well, basically the, the Georgian calendar actually starts from here, like this. And the Persian calendar starts from here like this, from spring to spring. This one is from winter solstice to winter solstice, almost, yeah? 25th of December is Christmas and 21st of December is winter solstice in the Northern Hemisphere, yeah? So usually you see this 21st December, this is 21st of June, this is 21st of March, this is 21st of September around that time, yeah? Equinox, equinox, solstice, solstice, yeah? Okay, so this angle, this particular angle should be, uh, should be the reason that we have seasons, beautiful seasons and four seasons and, and, uh, as a source of inspiration for many things and also making the planet more habitable and interesting, okay? Maybe better explained here, but I wanted you to help me figure this out from scratch again. But as a reminder, you have this information here when you download this again. So if you were to make the simplest possible model of the solar angles for our location on the planet Earth, this is something that I claim to be the simplest model ever for solar angles of incidence. And this, this is something you can, you can make by yourself. Um, I made it as, as strictly for educational purposes because I didn't want to give people that this is a, the, the idea that this is a tricky business. Because if you understand it, then you should be able to make the simplest model all by yourself. I've made it before, but I think, uh, it's only useful if you do it yourself, if you want to understand this perfectly, to make some points that would mimic exactly those angles of incidence, you can say for yourself that, okay, if you were exactly located on the equator, 
what would you see? So let's say you are standing on the equator somewhere. This is the planet Earth, right? Okay, no, bad idea. So let's say this is the planet Earth. You're on the equator. This is the spinning axis, right? You're on the equator. What do you see in terms of change of uh, the solar positions during this, the seasons? If there was no difference, but no like deviation from the from the normal of that plane, what would you see? Let us assume that there is no deviation between the Earth's spinning angle and uh, Earth's spinning axis and the, the normal of the plane on which the Earth revolves around the sun. The sun would come across at the same height each day. I don't know. So that would be a situation like this one, right? Yeah. So, um, it would have been always perpendicular, right? So now let's say that we have a little bit of a deviation towards this side. Then what do we see? Sun would be lower. Yeah, so do, do you, don't you agree that we get exactly the same amount of deviation on this side and this side? Throughout the year. Right, so somewhere in the somewhere in the spring, we are exactly here. Somewhere in the autumn, we are exactly here, on the equinox locations. But in the summer, there will be the sun position will be almost here, and in the winter, it will be almost here. Right. Now, instead of being on the equator, imagine that you are somewhere here. The only thing that changed is your latitude, isn't it? Right? So then I figured the only thing that has to change is that this plane that I was talking about, so this is exactly the Earth, the, the deviation angle from the spinning uh, axis to the, um, let's call it delta, plus delta and minus delta. This is what we would get without any deviation, right? So plus delta, minus delta. And then if your location is somewhere else, you have a latitude angle. You put this latitude angle here and you get yourself the simplest solar model ever. So these points on this kind of a spherical surface would give you the positions of the sun, almost. Yeah, I'm discarding any kind of unnecessary details here. Like the difference between hours in countries because that's usually a political thing. And I'm only talking about hours that you could uh, get from a solar, solar clock, yeah? So at noon every day, you, the sun positions will be along these lines. I'm talking about solar noon, right? Early in the morning, there will be, let me see, from the east, early in the morning, the sun will rise from this direction, east. Yeah, so this one being north, south, east, west. Did I get it right? Yeah. And it will set in this, on this side, somewhere in the west, right? And so on a single day, you will be traveling from, the sun at least appears to be traveling. It does not travel, we are rotating. But the sun position appears to go from here to here, right? On a single day. So this could be a day, which, which special day could this be? The autumn equinox or the spring equinox, right? Because this is exactly in the middle, right? As we go towards the summer, then the sun rays get more perpendicular in a sense, right? And you get what? You get, you get to these kind of days. So from the spring equinox to the summer, you get to a 21st of June, you're almost here, right? 21st of December, you have the lowest altitudes for the sun or elevations for the sun, you're here. 
So once again, you will be at this point that will be the autumn equinox. This is the spring equinox. I call it SE. This is autumn equinox. This is summer solstice, and this is winter solstice for a point in the Northern hemisphere. And then you get back to the same thing and the cycle repeats, right? This is a very simple model, but why did I cut it here? Because this, this should be all around the planet, right? Because two hours later, somewhere else will be the morning and so on and so forth, right? But the reason I cut it here is something that is known as a solar window. So if I look at it from here and here, this is like four hours minus and plus noon. This is four hours plus, this is four hours minus noon, something like that. Why? Because in these hours, the sun rays are more or less at an angle that they can impart some significant amount of energy. Let's say six hours before noon, the, the sun rays are so horizontal that they're probably obstructed by so many obstructions. And even if not, they have traveled so much through the, the, the atmosphere that they have lost a lot of their energy. So these are the hours that are important for solar studies. This is called the solar window. Right? The hours yeah. during which the sun has some significant energy to, to impart. Yes, please. Um, well, those hours before those, uh, the, the plus four and minus four at the end of the day and the beginning of the day, those yeah. hours are like super valuable for humans to see mm -hmm. because it's the sun rise and sundown. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but it's a bit so, of a luxury that usually we don't afford in urban settings. I mean, yeah. if you want to do a, a computation at a mass scale, you could, of course, go to the ground level and, and think about sunset and sunrise. Yeah, but That's a bit unlikely that you have, I mean, it would be a very luxury position if you have the, both, uh, you know, unless you're living in a high rise, then it's somewhat unlikely that you get these angles. Yes, but it makes high rise buildings uh, valuable. So yeah. therefore, it might be uh, like it is something to maybe also compute. Yeah, yeah, sure, definitely. So this is, First, this is mostly about energy, right? So yeah. because at those hours, the, the sun rays do not have so much energy to impart. Yeah, yeah. So you don't get the vitamin D and stuff. Yeah. But yeah. Or you, you could go up to any point that you can see. So basically, you can go up to the horizon, right? So the only yeah. points that you would cut, there are points that are actually lower than the horizon because they are on the other side of the planet, right? Yeah. So there's no way on Earth that you will see those rays, right? <laughs> no. So, but to, to speed up the computations, because this is typically where your computations take time, you know, as many points as you have here, you have to shoot rays. And, yeah. and if you manage to somehow reduce this area or the number of points in this area, then you can speed up your computation. But you're absolutely yeah. right. They also have value, for human value, those hours. And that's probably why some high-rise buildings are more expensive than low-rise buildings, right? Yeah, pro definitely, I think. Yeah. So it's, it's quite romantic to look at sunrise and sunset from your penthouse, right? So that, that sort of thing. Yeah, that that's definitely has something to do. To, that definitely has something to do with the value of a public. But these are typical in uh, solar studies to, uh, for especially those concerning energy to cut the, the uh, sunlight hours to these ones. Even if you don't want to cut, so we are basically creating a band like a, on a sphere, right? A band that goes uh, sideways as to the delta, the, the deviation angle between the Earth spinning axis and and the normal of the plane on which the Earth is rotating, which is an angle which is almost a constant angle. It is slightly changing, by the way. Uh, but uh, I think nowadays it's around 23 degrees, as far as I remember. Last time I checked, it was about this much. Yeah. Um, okay, where was I? Ah, okay, but what, how do I make these points, by the way? If you are wondering how to make these points, and that's something of, of a very nice exercise that you can do, is you can do this, you can make these points by means of the so-called spherical coordinates.
And those are exactly the same coordinates that I talked about here. That's the connection. You're thinking about the coordinates of every point in terms of phi and theta, and you get to x, y, and z from phi and theta. You see how you can do this? More or less? So if you have phi and theta and r, do you have enough information to, to determine the position of a point here in this system? Shall we do a quick check to make everyone comfortable? So I have a point here. I have the radius of the hemisphere or the sphere. I have phi and I have theta. Can I get to the coordinates of this point? Tell me the coordinates. X will be, so X being this coordinate. First, I should project it downwards and then I should project it to this axis. How do I project it to, to here? We already did that, right? R, oh, let me use a different color. X will be, so we already computed this much, right? So this was R times cosine of phi, right? What should I do to get to, to X now? R times cosine of theta. Hmm? R times cosine of theta, right? No, a small mistake. Is it the sine? Wait, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay, let, the, let the, me the, ask the someone else. Sander, you have, you have answered so many questions. See, Brent, what do you think? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> What's the angle here? volunteer don't be afraid don't don't think about what you have memorized just just assess the situation. is it times theta times what theta the angle no volunteer sine of theta sine of theta yeah why uh for the cosine is the Upper one in the sign is the this angle, right? Yeah, okay. is, it, is it not? No, it's it's the other. So it's it's cosine of theta. Yeah, don't don't try to use your memory. Yeah, just just look at this situation. So we did one projection already. Yeah. So we got to this point. So this projection to this point. We got to this point. Now we have this point. We want to project it to from hypotenuse to the to the x-axis. That should be cosine of theta, that's the only thing you need to remember. Yeah, that's the, def the very definition of cosine of theta, which is the, uh, the x over the hypotenuse is the cosine of theta, right? Therefore, being interested in x, so this th whole thing is whatever, you can call it w for whatever, yeah? So whatever this is, times cosine of theta should be x. Yeah, so this is an auxiliary variable. Just give it a name so that you get comfortable with it and then you can continue with the rest. So why similarly should be how much? Again, we should work with this one, but this time we have to project to this other axis. So what will it be? Come on. Sine of theta? Yes. What times sine of theta? Whatever that is times sine of theta, right? Right? What about Z? There's something called a, a public fear of mathematics that is completely irrational. Just because there are so many Greek letters and so on, so many people are afraid of these things. If you want to get comfortable with them, the best thing you can do is to go to a Greek restaurant and ask for the Greek menu and start deciphering the menu from the Greek letters. Yeah, that's really fun. Actually, I've done that in Greece. <laughs> I think if you go to a Greek restaurant here, that should be possible as well, right? As soon as you start to get to know these letters, the, the Greek letters and, and get yourself familiarized with some of the terminology, then it doesn't look like gibberish anymore, yeah? Okay, so tell me, what is that? R 
minus C times cos uh, theta. Who is that, Milu? Yes. Very nice. R sine of C. This is perfect. R sine of C gets us this much, right? Correct. This is R sine of C gets us exactly this height. So Milo, is that sufficient? I think so. You don't think so? No, I do think so. Okay, you do think so, okay. So this is, I think sufficient because it gets us exactly the height of this point, right? Because this height and this height are the same. So congratulations, now we managed to make, to decipher spherical coordinates, okay? If you're computing them on a plane, then you call them polar coordinates, if you hear the term. And with polar coordinates, you can do cool things like making spirals and so on. With spherical coordinates or cylindrical coordinates, you can do the same. What do you think will be cylindrical coordinates, by the way? If you only compute the position of a point with r and theta, then you have polar coordinates. If you just Sorry, if you just raise or extrude these coordinates, then you have cylindrical coordinates. If you also consider another angle for phi, then you have spherical coordinates, yeah? So the information content, notice that the information content is exactly, again, three numbers. Phi, theta, and r determine a point in the same way that x, y, and z determine a point in this coordinate reference system. Okay. So that's how you get to the, the simplest solar simulation model, but this is the, the real one, which has this kind of strange feature that is called analemma. The hour of, um, this is the declination angle or the deviation between the Earth's spinning angle and the, the normal of that plane. The, the delta that I was talking about. Um, and there is something about um, the hour, the hours as they're computed for, for you know, setting your clock and stuff like that, that makes them slightly different from those straight lines that I, I had drawn in the, the simple model, yeah? To be honest, I'm not interested as to why they are slightly different because that, that only has to do with the way we compute hours. It doesn't change much of the way we compute things with these kind of positions. So these are not exactly points. They are only auxiliary points that help us define the sun vectors. What do I mean by that? Why should we even think about a sun vector? Why not a sun ray for that matter? Let's really straighten this. So I have a point here. From that point, I can make a vector. How? However, I get this point. So let's say you have a magical piece of software that gives you this, which we do have that sort of a software. You will use it in the afternoon. So you have a point here and you have a location and then you get these two points. You put these two points together, you get a vector. Right? But how does that help? Why should the vector be sufficient? Shouldn't we be talking about rays? Nancy, what do you think? I don't know. <laughs> so do you remember that we talked about, I mean, in your location, if you're most probably in Delft, and my location, I'm in Delft, do you think we, see the sun at different angles? No. Or, or the, the solar angle for our location, do, do you think there's any difference? So if we see the sun in almost the same position towards you know, the, the geographical system, do we really need to think about the sun rays as the rays that we, we talked about at the beginning of this class? Do we, do we really need to know where the sun is? No. 
So, I can use this vector. Can you use this vector? If you want to compute a ray, if you want to compute a ray to see whether you see the sun or not, what would you do? It's a question to everybody. Bit of a tough question. Suppose you want to find out if you see the sun at your location right now or not, right? Frank. Now continue because you were asking. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. This is the second question. So I'm I'm what hoping everybody to see that this is not a simple question. So what do I need to do if I need to determine whether I see the sun or not at this hour? So let's let's double check some facts, right? What are the hours in a day? What kind of directions do they determine? The hours in a day should be talking about these kind of lines, right? So this would be, for instance, a, a particular day. Where are we right now? We are in November, right? So we are somewhere close to here. So this could be our day. This could be today. Yeah. And what time is it? Yeah, past noon, somewhere around towards the afternoon. So we should probably be exactly here, right? And let's say this is Delft, right? So you get this point and this point, you get a vector. Now what? How do we uh, determine whether, for instance, I see from my location or you see from your location the sun? Everybody, this is a quiz. Is it the latitude? No, um, okay, as a hint, um, let's say we have exactly this position as X, Y, Z. We have our own position as X, Y, Z. We differentiate them, we get the sun vector, right? And I want an answer in terms of an intersection, right? Should I shoot a ray towards the position of the sun? Should I also know the position of the sun or do I have enough information? You do have enough information, right? Because you don't have a direction or because they're all uh, parallel? Yes. There's another ray, but it's not a vector. Okay, so that's a perfect answer. But what what do I what do I do exactly? What should I do? So let's say this is a building in front of me, right? And this is me, right? And let's say there's yet another taller building here, right? What should I shoot exactly towards the position of the sun or do I have enough information as Frank says? I have this ray pointing from the sun towards my location. What do I do? It's not exactly a ray, it's just a vector, isn't it? Yeah? How do I figure out the fact that my Sun view is actually blocked by a building, which is not true because I, I'm getting some sun rays. Maybe if there is an intersection between the vector and the building. The vector and the building. Does a vector have an intersection with the building? That's it. Well, I got a ray, but I don't know why. Ray, okay. That's, yeah. that's much better. So what, what kind of a ray? If I want to form a ray, as Lotus says, then I need what? I need a vector, which I do have. And I need a point, which I do have. But if I wanted to shoot a ray from the sun, then I needed a piece of information that I actually don't have. Right? So, but philosophically, you see that we have enough information. Yes, Marcia, tell me. Down to bed from where you are. Yes, perfect, thank you. Okay, so. Marcia and Lotte managed to answer the question. So then we shoot backwards. We just have this vector, we negate it, we reverse the vector because that would be the same thing, right? So instead of shooting from the sun towards this location, we shoot from this location towards the sun. 
then we continue and then we figure out that well, actually marginally passes through in between from in between these buildings and that that means that I can see the sun at this hour that means I have direct sunlight at this hour of the day on the 24th of November 2020. Does the year matter? No, 21st of November, right? Does the hour matter? Yes, right? Because the hour changes, then I have a different vector. That means I have a different ray. That means I may or may not see the sun. And this hour, which is a metaphor for saying that I may or may not receive the direct sunlight at this hour or not, right? Yes? Yeah, okay. Okay, a, a bunch of things about if for your information where these things come from, but you don't really have to compute any of these things. These are just for your information. If you're wondering why you see these kind of uh, um, kind of curves, if you even uh, take a good camera and start uh, recording the locations of the sun, doing uh, doing what one particular hour in the entire year, right? That's where you see these strange things happening, right? This is the same hour, like two o'clock in the afternoon during the entire year. You see what I'm talking about? These ones. This is the same hour, right? So along this line, we see one hour, one particular hour. Along these kind of lines, we see a particular day, right? And where do you see the months or seasons? So the entire days from 21st of March until the 21st of June are covered in this area, right? In this direction. And then from 21st of June until 21st of September, then we are go, going backwards from 20 along these kind of lines, right? From 21st of September to an, towards 21st of December, or Christmas, we are going this way. And then again, from Christmas towards the spring equinox, we are going upwards again, and so on and so forth. Right? Everybody comfortable with this? Yeah, and the only reason we see these things is because of some particular ways in which we compute hours, yeah? So they don't change the facts so much. But they actually help us see that this is actually a cycle of hours. This is not cycle of points. This is not a line of points. We actually have two times uh, as many points as we could see in the previous simple model. This is maybe one reason why this model is better than this one. Because for every point here, we should compute twice. Because once we are here on the 21st of March, once we are here on the 21st of September, and so on and so forth. For every point, we will visit that point twice for some positions, you know, approximately speaking. This is the accurate version, which again has exactly the same span. So from here to here, you have 20 plus 23, negative 23 degrees of range. The only difference is along this analemma hourly angles. But in the previous model, you wouldn't visit the most winter, uh, what, yeah, the, the solstice, solstice twice, yeah. right? Those would only be once. Yeah, during every year, you visit every solstice and every equinox only once. No, yeah, you're right. You're in the, the previous equinoxes, model. Yeah, in both models. So for the equinox locations actually pertain to the same kind of position here. Right? So they both represent a, uh, an, uh, some kind of an equilibrium solution, hence the name equinox, right? They're in the middle, both of them. But the summer solstice is here, the winter solstice is here. Yeah. So, so if you will be in this position twice in a year. Yeah. So in every other position throughout the year, you will be there twice, but the winter solstice and summer solstice are very special because you will only have one of them throughout the year, right? Yeah. Um, questions. That's why there are good moments for celebrations. Yeah. 
Uh, perhaps I've missed it, but yeah. about the loop, how do you determine whether you're on the right side or the left side when you're in a particular hour and day? Uh, because from the sunrise, the sunrise is on the east, right? Mm -hmm. so this is kind of like the north, right? And we are talking about the northern hemisphere, right? So this should be a south, the north pole, the south pole, right? Mm -hmm. the, uh, the sun is rising from the east and is setting towards the west, right? So this should be exactly 12 o'clock in a day, the day being this one or this one. Let's say I know, but 12 o'clock has like two parts what because it's parts? a loop, like. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm ignoring that. I'm ignoring that because that, that complicates things a little bit. Okay, but, but I was just wondering how you- position, in terms of the relative position, if it's afternoon, then you are towards the west. And if it's before noon, then you are towards the east somewhere. Does that answer your question? Um, a bit. <laughs> so what, what, is, what is strange about it? So let's say this is the analemma that corresponds to noon hours, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like an eight figure sort of, this one. Yeah? Yeah. So you are, so at this point of the year, which uh, is 24th of November, let's say we are here on the analemma. And for every hour, in fact, you can have one of these analemma uh, diagrams, but it would be um, kind of pointless to draw them for every single hour or every single minute or second, right? Mm -hmm. Because then you will get so many of them. So typically they are drawn for every hour, yeah? And so let's say one hour, um, 1 p.m. would be this one. 2 p.m. will be this one and so forth. Mm -hmm. Okay. 3 p.m. And all the hours a.m. will be these other analemmas on the other side because they are earlier. They are closer towards the sun, sunrise. Yeah. Can I miss something or are east and west there? Which yeah, yeah, I was about to say the same thing. Are West they, is uh, on the left, right? And East is on the right? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it's the other way around? Yeah, yeah, the other way around. Uh, I was thinking I got, I got insane. No, I, 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 kind <laughs> of, no, I kind of considered myself on a cross at that location. And then I... I but let me think about it for a second. No, I'm it's actually, correct the way it is, right? Is it? It's not. Yeah, because no. if you look, if you if you stand if you stand on the plane and look up, then east and west are correct, or not? Yeah, oh no, never mind. So I'm actually sit where I'm sitting right now. I'm looking to the south. So my right hand actually points no. no, no wait, wait. And I should be looking this way because I'm looking at the north. Am I? Okay, I got confused. No, I'm actually sitting towards the south, right? I'm sitting towards the south and my right hand therefore actually shows the west. My left hand shows the east. So... Yeah, so then it's switched, right? Yeah, it's switched. Yeah. Frank is right. Good eyes. Thank you. So this is wrong for the record. This is east. Let, let me just reorient myself for a second just to grasp this. Then, this is west. Okay. I think this makes sense right now because I'm now looking at the south. So I'm sitting in this orientation. And I know the West and East. Yeah. But grasping something is different from, from remembering it. So I, that's why I wanted to be sure. Okay. So then everything I told you, Ada, is actually the other way around. Sorry. <laughs> so these are all the hours in the in the afternoon, and these are all the hours in the morning. So well, it didn't really matter for me anyway. Yeah. It was more the principle of it. Yeah which I understood now. Thank you. Okay. So uh, now you should be able to make sense of all this uh, stuff. 
present and you're a little bit of confusing in different terminologies that you may encounter, but you should not be afraid of anymore. You can always map them towards your mental model, which is theta and phi. So this, is, this happens to be gamma and alpha for whatever reason, I have no idea. And this other angle, which is the angle computed from the zenith, you also see that angle in many solar studies, including the sky view factor, because sometimes it's handy to compute angles from the zenith and that, that changes everything, right? So if I may offer you a little piece of advice, do not memorize any of these equations, just understand how you can construct them and, and understand how you can verify them, right? It's not so that theta is always representing the same thing or alpha is representing. There, there's nothing divine about any of these symbols. They just uh, help mathematicians to differentiate between angles and, 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 and other sort of numbers. And, and it's customary to show angles with, uh, with these Greek letters, lowercase Greek letters. And usually these are common for showing angles. But you also use Greek letters for many other things like scalars in, in equations where there are vector quantities or um, tensor quantities involved, you want to differentiate them. And so it's, it's customary to use Greek letters uh, to, to, to make such differentiations. But other than that, there's nothing really divine about any of these symbols. And unfortunately, they are the, the different, or maybe you could say fortunately, the different pieces of text uh, about these kind of things are not exactly consistent in terms of their terminology or their notations, their nomenclature. So you need to um, sometimes spend some time putting these things together and, and, and making a consistent terminology. So these are again only mentioned for your information if you're interested, but then again, you have enough information to, to get to the workshop of the afternoon, which is about computing uh, this kind of a cloudy thing about the solar envelope. We will talk much more in the afternoon and you actually have a, a, a better improved algorithm um, from Shervin um, for this one, which has a very curious improvement. So if you can read this and, and see the improvement and tell me the improvement, I would be very happy. There's a very curious improvement. So this one takes into account all the points of on the neighbor buildings that are supposed to see the sun and our building could be somehow in the way of those points seeing the sun. And by now you know exactly what I mean by seeing the sun, right? So they are supposed to receive direct sunlight and our building or a part of our building, a chunk of our building happens to be somehow obstructing their view towards the sun at that point in time, which means that we are blocking their right to direct sunlight, right? I think everybody is comfortable with that definition right now. And now we want to remove those parts as a courtesy to the neighbors, right? And it's a relative thing, right? So it's impossible that no part of our building anywhere in time or in space is in the way of getting light, but we want to remove the worst of the worst, right? Those are the, which are the most annoying parts that are almost always blocking the right to sun, direct sunlight. So we want to get to some numbers showing us the number of times they happen to be obstructing their view towards the sun, you could say, right? Hence the visibility. So now I'm wrapping it up, right? So then we intersect them with rays shot from the neighbors or we do something better. That is what Shervin is going to tell you in the afternoon. You can also think about it. What's a better way of doing this? which is about not casting a shadow on the neighbors, literally, using the sunlight uh, vectors. And by now you know why we're talking about vectors instead of rays, let's say, right? Because being here or here, the solar position is actually a relative position. It doesn't really change the, the ray. It's not like we are talking about, we're not talking about the desk lamp like this one. Right, so if it were a desk lamp, then we had to really shoot a ray and it would be different from here to here. But since we are talking about such a huge disk of light, being here or here, the solar vectors, the sun vectors perfectly describe the direction of all of these rays. So there's no point writing them down as rays. There's no point recording the position of the sun 
because it's not a death clap, it's the sun, right? For heaven's sake, it's the sun, right? This is so huge, right? So <laughs> we don't need the position of the sun, we just need a vector. So all these points in here are just there to help us get the vector that points towards the sun rays, right? That determines the sun rays. And then we start shooting rays from these directions. So forget about the desk lamp, sorry. We start shooting rays in this direction or maybe even in this direction. That's what you're going to do in the afternoon. And then we will find out if some of them are the super annoying ones for the neighbors. And then our purpose will be to make this kind of a Swiss Emmental cheese, block of cheese, right? So if some parts of these are, ha happen to be always making our neighbors angry, we're going to remove them to make our neighbors more friendly. Yeah, or in order to be more friendly with our neighbors, whichever way you <laughs> want to interpret that, okay? Yeah? So, uh, this is it. For now, the rest will be in the afternoon in the workshop, and I hope by now you have a better feeling about all these things, and I'm happy to take some questions and stay some much longer, but other than that, the class is officially finished and we'll see you in the afternoon for the workshop. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but please don't be shy if you have questions, I can stay a bit longer. Ask the question, Levi, if you're wondering about something. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, I'm just looking, I'm, I'm looking through the slides of what I didn't really get. Yeah. And it's definitely the integral, integral. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not even sure how to say it right. It's an integral. How, yeah, how relevant that is to me to really fully understand all the formulas. Is it something I should really dedicate time to? Um, if you want, I can tell you a bit as in terms of what you need to know. Mm -hmm. the, the two concepts are the most important things. The formulas are not so important. The concepts are very important though. So if you studied in a very old fashioned school of uh, mathematics, then you, they would probably require you to re memorize how to compute an integral by hand. But the reason I tell you that the concept is more important is that you need to uh, be able to compute integrals, not to calculate them by hand. And for computing them, you have to understand what they mean, right? So let's, I, I, can, I can give you some hints and this is recorded, so then that should be also helpful for the others. So let's say if you wanted to, um, this is something that I don't really like, but anyway, m many people just talk about them as if they're meant to compute the area under a curve. Yeah, but for historical reasons, I also start with that, but then there are probably better examples as to why you need to compute the integrals. But regardless, then let me tell you this. Let me tell you first about the differentials and then I will get back to the integrals. Yeah, so I'm deviating from that path. So if you have a function of some variable, let's say the price of oil over time, I have to think of this notorious function, right? And let's say that for some reason, I hope you're not into this business, but for some reason you are investing in oil, right? I would very much prefer that you invested in solar energy, but anyway. And then you wanted to predict what will be the price of oil in the next week because you're deciding to sell your, your stock or not, right? Then how would you predict? Well, you cannot really predict the price of oil because it depends on, uh, on many political factors that are super uninteresting and, and dangerous. Um, but anyway, if, if there was some kind of a, an equation and that equation was supposedly somehow rational, then wouldn't be 
if you're talking about the prediction in a very short period of time, then maybe you can kind of see that it's going down, right? That's something that you intuitively do anyway, right? So how do we state this fact? So it's kind of like we are, we are fitting a line to this equation here, and we are kind of guessing that it will go down here, right? That means that um, we are actually equating this whole function at this point with this line. And we say, if you were to guess, yeah, my educated guess would be, I mean, we don't have a crystal ball. We cannot uh, really foresee what happens next in, in any of those countries selling oil and so on and so forth, or the buyers of oil, wars, et cetera, et cetera. We don't know any of those things. But if you were to take one educated guess without the crystal ball of Robin Hood, then I would take this guess, right? That maybe we can fit a line and say that in, in the next couple of seconds, maybe it is predictable that the price of oil is somewhere around this line. In the next few seconds, it will be somewhere else, right? Somebody tweets something on Twitter, then the price of oil goes, high, goes higher, right? But maybe in a few seconds, we can predict it near this line, right? So what's at stake here? So let's say this is a function of time. Um, that price, or let's say P as a function of time, P as a function of time. And then the difference if I magnify here is that we are thinking about some price over time at this point. Let's call this moment, moment T and some moment after that moment, t plus delta t, delta t being a very small increment in time. Let's say tenths, two tenths of a second, right? Right, so if you go to such level of detail, then you see a line basically between these two. At least you want to assume that you can see a line. And then what's special about this line? How do you make a difference between this line and some other line, which would probably go down, right? This one is ascending, this one is descending, right? Then there's something about the slope of this line. You know, it could have been also stagnant, right? Right? So this is an ascending line. That means that if it were about a hilly landscape, it would be a, an uphill, uphill hike. This would have been a downhill hike. Right. So what's the, what's the special about an uphill hike? So let me change the notation to H of trajectory instead of time, right? And let's say I want to find out the slope of this trajectory. So H of somewhere forward in the trajectory minus somewhere in the trajectory where we are standing divided by this delta T the distance that we have taken in the trajectory should be giving us some idea of the slope. Wouldn't you agree? If I take one step forward and then the height goes so much higher, then I have a positive ascent in the height. If this happens to be lower than this one, then I get a negative ascent or a descent in the height. In the, in the height. Therefore, that is a, a measure of how quickly what we are interested in decreases or increases with, an, with a small increment in an independent variable. We're going to one journey from, let's say, um, here, our hut in the, in the, in the forest to, to the peak in the forest. So that's going to be an uphill journey. But maybe the peak is here, so somewhere we have to go to the valley and then go high again, right? So at every single point here, we can, if we are in the small vicinity of, of this point, then we can think about the slope as it is felt exactly at that point, right? So around here, it gets really steep. Around here, it's less steep. Here is like downhill and so forth, right? And unfortunately, we cannot fly from here to here, right? So we need to care about the trajectory, right? So that's, that's the essential idea of what we call a differential. This is a differential that is shown with 
delta H over delta T, right? But when the limit, the, the differential is a small, when the limit, when we're talking about this at the limit delta T approaching zero, then it's customary to show it with differential of H over differential of T, right? Because this is just a notation, right? Delta H, we call this H of the next moment minus the H of this moment. We call it delta H because it different because it marks a difference between the two. This is obviously a differential, right? Small increment in time. But more generally speaking, this is a difference in the independent variable. This is a difference in the dependent variable. This is what we are interested in. Yeah, so we want to compute the rate of change of something that depends on something else. The height depending on where we are in the journey the price of oil depending on when we are in the course of time. The, the, I share it. The, yeah, the, some function indicating something else, temperature in the course of time, et cetera, et cetera, right? So always the dependent divided by the independent, right? So you get an idea of this relative speed at which the dependent changes proportionate to a very small change in the independent. That's the concept of a derivative, right? So now if you do exactly the opposite, say someone has told me the speed at which something is growing. Yeah. So I only know the speed and where it has been before. Can you tell me where it is now? Then here we had this information and we computed this information, right? It's just, it's the opposite. So suppose that you wanted to actually figure this one out. And you had everything else here somehow. Then what would you, what would you do? So you would say that, let's say this is customary to call it H prime of T. Let's say just, this is just a notation, right? This is the speed. Let's call it the speed, right? The rate of change, the speed or the derivative, yeah? And you have everything else in this equation, but you want this one, yeah? So you have to say that H prime H prime of T times delta T. Um, plus H of time T should be this one, H of time T plus delta T. So computing this is the same as integration in fact, basically. So someone, you call someone, you have a, a consultant for your investments in, in oil. I hope that you're investing in something else, but anyhow, you call someone and that's, that person tells you that the, the speed at which the price is increasing is this much. You put this into this equation and you get to this estimate that I told you before, the next moment, right? This is why people usually associate it with this, uh, integral, yes, indeed, it kind of corresponds to this the, the surface area under the, the, the curve, but this is not the most interesting thing about it. The most interesting thing about it is that this is the reverse situation. You have the rate of change and you want to compute the value of the function whose rate of change is known to you. That would be an integral, which is the exact opposite of differentiation in that sense. In differentiation, you are looking for the rate of change of a function whose values are known to you, right? In integration, you're doing the opposite. You're figuring out what was the function whose rate of change is like this one, yeah? And that happens to be a sum. 
and that sum is called the integral. So if uh, that's a much longer story, but I think this much is should should do the job if you read the, the slide later on, which is characterized by the area under the, the 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 curve or the graph of the function. But that's not the most interesting thing about the integral. This is the most interesting about the integral. That is the opposite of differentiation in a way. In that sense, it is also called an un anti derivative. Yeah. Anti, you said? Yeah, anti derivative. So if this one is called a derivative, this, the integral is also called an anti derivative. So it's the opposite of the derivative. As an operator, why do we call it an operator? Because it's, uh, it's something, it's like a machine that takes a function and produces something out of a function, not out of some simple input variable, but out of a function. So in that sense, we could call that a functional, which is something that operates on function or an operator, that second term is less frightening, an operator, yeah? Yeah. Better? It's a lot better. Do you feel better or worse? <laughs> No, definitely better. I'll probably read the slides again and look at maybe some videos just to really make sure that I get it. But yeah, I get it. Uh, and the formulas really help. <laughs> yeah. But in this case, we, we use them for a very literal application, which was actually computing the area of a function. I, I wish I had a more fancy application here, but this is really the literal application for computing the area, the surface area. But that should be good enough for, for uh, educational material because it's more literal and it's more concrete. So you can, you can really see what's going on. They're really computing the area of a part of a hemisphere. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, sorry for keeping you here for, from your lunch break. You look very curious. I, so. I am curious. I want to understand everything, even if I don't get it. <laughs> okay, very good, very good. Okay, thank you. What time is the other class starting exactly? Two? Yeah.